Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am Bill Fox, your worship associate this morning, along with Brianna Zamborski. We are joined in worship leadership by accompanist Christina Dragon and vocalist Kay Riddinger. We also have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and Zoom bouncer, Drika DeGraff. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. We believe in justice and hospitality and have earned such designations from the Unitarian Universalist Association. We are a green sanctuary congregation, which means that we have educated ourselves and taken action to protect our environment. We are also a welcoming congregation, a term that means we are intentionally inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and families. Our commitment to both these programs was renewed this year. Our commitment to both of these uh, was renewed. And although there is no such designation for racial justice, we are deeply committed to that work as well. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030, and then later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups, and we hope that you'll participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping us with the first time, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you'll stay after the service and get to know us. We have two announcements this morning. Water communion is coming up on Sunday, September 13th. This year, we are inviting everyone to make a sign with water droplets or in the shape of a water droplet with your answer to the prompt, I am. Your answer should reflect something about your identity or how you're feeling, like, I am hopeful, I am left-handed, or I am awesome. BUC member and resident video wizard, Curtis Zatuna will be collecting digital photos of your signs and adding them to a video montage that will play during the service on the 13th. Take a photo of your completed sign and send it to Curtis by Thursday, September 10th. See your weekly email update for complete details. Our second announcement is the Monday morning coffee with the minister meetings are ending. Tomorrow morning's meeting will be the last one. In today's service, we will talk about how we take care of ourselves, especially in a pandemic. Thank you again for joining us this morning and whenever you're watching this or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. And with that, we will our service will begin. Our prelude will be Only Trust Your Heart by Sammy Carter and the Alamon from the Bach French Suite number four. Thank you. 
every day brings struggle. Every day brings joy. Every day brings us the opportunity to ease the struggle of another, to be the joy in another's life. May this flame remind us to light to each other, our light to each other and to the world. Let us sing our opening hymn, number 86, Blessed Spirit of My Life. Number 86. today are by Gretchen Haley. Surrender to this life. Give up the fight for some other moment, some other life than here and now. Give up the longing for some other world, the wishing for other choices to make, other songs to sing, other bodies, other ages, other countries, other stakes. Purge the past, Forgive the future, for each come too soon. Surrender only to this, this day, this hour. Not because it does not constantly break your heart, but because it also beckons with beauty, startles with delight. If only we keep waking up. This is the gift we have been given. These body clothes, this heartbreak, this pulse, this breath, this light, these friends, this hope. Here we remember ourselves, all a part of it all, giving thanks together. Come, let us worship. We are stewards of this community and of our beautiful campus. Even when we're not worshiping on site, we are still responsible for expenses like utilities, lawn maintenance, and monthly leasing fees for the copier and postage meter. And we pay for Zoom too. This is a house of memory and hope, of love and of justice. Let there be an offering to support this beloved community. Your contributions can be sent using Venmo, username at B-U-C-M-I. 
or through our website. Giving through either platform is easy and free. You can also put a check in the mail to us. We ask you to consider how much you've relied on BUC in the past months and do what you can to support our good work. Please give generously. We have come to the time in our service we set aside for, our, for prayer, reflection, and meditation. We begin with joys and sorrows. Each Sunday, we recognize the highs and lows of our lives. There were no joys or sorrows written this week, but for those joys and sorrows, shared and unshared, know that we hold you in our hearts. I invite you to move with me now further into prayer and reflection. Let your memories, good and bad, come and go without lingering. These are not you. They are merely images projected on the screen of your mind. Don't be trapped in this dark theater. Go outside and meet the life set before you in this moment. May it be so, amen, and blessed be. We would be one. Yeah. 
It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of life. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Charles Dickens. For some of us, this is, if not the best of times, not so bad. For others, it is the worst. How we look at our lives depends on the story we tell ourselves. The stories we told ourselves in the past, tell ourselves now, and will tell ourselves in the future. We tell ourselves these stories to cope and to survive and to maintain sanity. We tell these stories to ourselves throughout our, our lives in difficult times and in more ordinary times. One story caught my attention two years ago. Julia Salazar ran for and won a New York State Senate seat. Her story was that she had been raised poor and partly grew up in Colombia. Her brother said, no, not true. They grew up in the US and not poor. The brother said the times in Colombia were just lengthy visits to grandparents after their own parents divorced. Mom agreed with the brother. This story grabbed my attention because at about the same time, my mother said to me, for a reason I don't remember, you grew up on Tyreman and in Lafayette Park. And I said, Mom, I did not grow up in Lafayette Park. By the time you moved to Lafayette Park, I had graduated college and was nearly 23. She was not convinced. I know my mom well enough to know this was not due to failing memory. A few months later, while my brother was visiting from Boston, the topic came up again. I think my mom was trying to prove she was right and asked my brother where he thought he had grown up. He said, on Tyreman and in Lafayette Park. And I said, you were 21 and a college senior when our, our parents moved. How can you say you grew up in Lafayette Park? Hmm. Like the Salazar family, I believe this is partially rooted in class. Julia Salazar was, perhaps, trying to establish an immigrant working class history as she sought votes in her district. Tyreman Avenue, where I lived, was the southern boundary of a housing project. The townhouse 
my parents bought in Lafayette Park was a larger, more attractive home designed by a world famous architect. I think, perhaps, my mother does not want to admit she raised her sons on the head edge of a housing project in a working class neighborhood. Working class was the initial draw for living there to my left-leaning pro-union parents. Over time, my mother came to see that housing projects do not have great reputations, and she now has a tendency to talk about how bad the neighborhood got. My brother, who attended Detroit's best high school, then the University of Michigan, and finally an Ivy League graduate school, has his own story to tell. And I do not think the Tigerman home enhances it. We were growing up in the same house at the same time, yet he tells a different story. How does he explain our different versions? Well, he went to high school near the home that my parents eventually bought three years after he finished high school. Does that justify saying he grew up there? I, on the other hand, do not have a problem with where I grew up, that I played ball in the projects, that I went to school in the projects. It was what it was. Of course, you're not hearing my family's version of the story. You're hearing mine, my story the one I tell about my life. Now, what story will I tell myself about living in this pandemic or about living in this time? Will it be the worst of times for me or the best? What I tell myself now is that it is good, at least in relation to the pandemic. I'm working from home. I'm driving less and reading more. I'm healthy. And each time I get a survey from my employer asking how I am doing in one word, I respond, great. I've taken this survey a half dozen times and every time I've responded, great. This may not seem like much of a story. Not all stories have exciting plots. I am fortunate to be able to work from home, but I also made the choice to stay at home to be safe. What are the stories people tell themselves that allow them to make unsafe choices? What story did people tell themselves when they joined a few hundred thousand motorcycle enthusiasts in Sturgis, South Dakota? What was the story told by the couple who used an underground parking garage to smuggle a hundred guests into their storybook wedding in San Francisco? What story do they tell themselves now? that they, and at least eight of their guests, have tested positive for COVID-19. I think about Herman Cain, the co-chair of Trump's Black Voter Outreach Initiative, who died recently of COVID-19. What was the story he told himself as he sat in a Tulsa arena with 6,000 others close together, even when they could have spread out, without a mask, even though masks were available. What is the story any of the people in that arena told themselves? The stories we tell ourselves about our lives during the pandemic and the actions we take because of those stories may at one extreme determine life or death, as it did for Herman Cain. At the other extreme, in the words of the late, late show's James Corden, it may determine whether we become a hunk, a chunk, or a drunk while we social distance. Charles Dickens wasn't writing about epidemics when he wrote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Dickens, however, did write about quarantining in Little Dorrit and isolation due to an epidemic in Bleak House. He wrote his novels before the modern understanding of germs and disease transmission was developed 
by Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and John Snow. But he understood that isolating oneself in an epidemic was difficult and necessary. Dickens, of course, was writing his character stories. But like the stories we tell ourselves about our, our own lives, they contained a colorful blend of both truth and fiction at the same time. My reading is from um, this 2018 Love Like Thunder uh, volume from the In Spirit series, which I highly recommend, by Jess Reynolds. When you are weary, waking up is enough. Putting on shoes before you walk out on wet leaves that plaster the driveway is enough. It is enough to love one person, one dog, one tree in a neighbor's yard, one 50 cent mug, from a thrift store. You turn on the radio in the car. You let the minivan merge into your lane. After three weeks of half darkness, you change the light bulb above your desk. It is enough to breathe, to put your face in your cold hands and tell your palms and the empty kitchen that you do not know what else to do. You open the blinds just enough to see if the mail carrier has come today. You turn your head at the sound of a musician on the street corner, their guitar slightly out of tune. You buy bananas at the supermarket and eat all but one before they turn to mush. It is enough to be here, to drink cold water from the tap, to fall asleep on your couch with a cat in the crook of your knees. It is enough to be alive. In thinking about this summer service, I kept saying to myself, don't talk about COVID, don't talk about COVID. Uh, but guess what, we're talking about COVID. Um, it's really hard because we're still here and uh, it's hard not to talk about the water you're swimming in. So also my story is timely. Tomorrow uh, is the first day of school in Ferndale, virtual school. In the morning, Helen and I will go outside and take her picture in front of the big blue spruce like we do every year. But then instead of hopping in the car, we'll head back up the porch steps and inside. She'll go to her room to log on to Google Classroom, Google Classroom and I'll stay in the kitchen and probably cry. I'm going to tell you my deepest, darkest secret now. I really struggle with being a mom. That does not mean I don't love my kid. I love her with everything. But the job is another story. You know those aptitude tests you take in high school that tell you what job would be best for you? I never actually took one, but um, I know of them. Basically, there is a world of careers out there that I'm better suited for. Jobs I love, jobs I'm great at or would be great at, jobs that make me feel good about myself, jobs that don't come with a mountain of shame because what kind of mother doesn't love her job? Prior to having my daughter, I was doing a lot of much needed work on myself. Then she came and that stopped. Now I took care of her all day. Many years later on the first day of kindergarten, unsurprisingly perhaps, I was that meme maybe you've seen of the mom smiling and waving from the soup in her bathrobe uh, with one hand and a glass of champagne in the other. Not really, no champagne, but uh, I was not the, the blubbering parents running after the school bus. Helen going to school all day meant that I was able to get some of my time back, some of my identity. I was able to start taking care of myself again. Then March 2020 happened. Not only was I a full-time mom again, but now a teacher too. Uh, so remember that aptitude test? I'm pretty sure that second from the bottom uh, would be teacher as 
jobs I'm least suited for. I'll also note now, I am not a bad person. And if you see yourself in this reflection already, you are not a bad person either. I know there are more moms out there like me. Good moms, but moms for who the role is not really our calling, but who do it anyway. Moms who don't talk about it, but instead suffer alone because, because mothers are supposed to love their jobs. That's a story we all need to stop telling. Imagine working a job you hate, but the outcome of which, strangely, matters to you more than anything in the world. That's what made this spring so awful. It was the worst of times for me, although it could have been much worse. When I have a full life outside of parenting, I'm the best mom I can be. When I don't, I feel resentful, angry, drained. Suddenly this spring, that full life was taken away and I had to spend all my time with her, teaching her. But what made this spring so awful wasn't these personal losses in and of themselves. It wasn't even those bad feelings, as bad as they felt. It was the shame of having them. And more than anything, it was the fear that my daughter would feel unwanted or unloved. It's so much more complicated than that. I read in a book once that children pick up on this stuff. We know there's a difference between needing a break from your kid and not loving your kid. But if you sigh when they walk into a room or tense at their touch, do they, do they know the difference in that moment? Does it matter? I was desperate to conceal my negative feelings, but pretending is exhausting. And pretty soon I had nothing left. Although I've been medicated for chronic depression for decades and had been making really good progress with self-compassion and therapy these past few years, all of a sudden, parenting and teaching with little relief brought on a major depressive episode and a serious bout of self-hate. This is the rock bottom part of my story. Now, a quote, I, a quote on Facebook in a true crime show called Dirty John changed everything. This is not entirely true. I was in therapy um, via Zoom with wonderful professionals and they of course get most of the credit, but uh, it's a good way to frame the story. So I saw this Facebook post, it was a quote. It said, parents, prioritize your ability to remain regulated for your child over your ability to provide them academic instruction. Academics don't protect your children from trauma. Your relationship does. That was the beginning of a shift. I was suffering. Our relationship was suffering. If I wanted to protect her from not only the trauma of COVID, but the trauma of living with a parent with mental health problems, I had to start taking care of myself again. Taking care of yourself in part means listening to your body and giving it what it needs. So I did. Sometimes I would just go lie down. Helen might come up and ask if I was all right, and I'd tell her, I'm just feeling sad or upset right now, so I'm taking a break. I actually think it's good for our kids to see us take care of ourselves, because maybe they will learn to do that also. Sometimes I would spend much of a day doing a puzzle. It's something I can get lost in without uh, being able to leave. Many things I would have done were not options at the time, but I did what I could, and it helped. However, taking the time to take care of myself meant less academics. Guess what else it meant? More screen time. I'm pretty sure every parent watching this right now had a little panic attack just hearing that word. Screen time and iPad can send us into a spiral of shoulds and sound bites about fresh air and sedentariness and brain development. Modern parenting means a lot of fear. So Helen and I fought about it, about screen time, in the middle of a global pandemic. There were tears and screaming from both of us daily. This isn't healthy for anyone, including my husband, who was in the basement working, probably praying to every God there is, which we can do because we're UUs, and Governor Whitmer too. 
to please let him go back to his office. This is where my second pop culture induced breakthrough comes in. There's a scene in this show, Dirty John, where the mother reminds her adult daughter, sometimes when you're playing tug of war, you have to let go of the rope. Helen and I were playing tug of war. I needed to cede control. I needed to surrender. I needed to let go of the rope. Maybe not even pick it up. Everything connected, just like my puzzles. Let go of this anxiety and all the anxieties of modern parenthood and take the time to take care of myself because that's how I could take care of my child. After that, Helen did spend some more time on the iPad, but she also wrote a killer report on Helen Keller, made clay sculptures, listened to podcasts, and skateboarded in the living room. Since the weather was warmer, I spent more time in the garden. Sometimes Helen joined me. We dug together, threw grubs to the robin, and enriched the soil. On the surface, it might have looked like I was neglecting my child and her education and just doing whatever I wanted. But if this was you, mom, dad, parent, caretaker, you know that's not the case. That's why Unitarian Universalists assume the best intentions of everyone and don't make judgment, judgments based on how things seem on the surface. The deeper truth is this. While we didn't put a sticker in every square on the schoolwork chart and in fact neglected entire subjects, we got a gold star for putting ourselves and each other first. When Helen thinks back on her COVID experience someday, I hope the story she tells herself is this one. One of resilience, one of, feel, one of feeling our feelings of our family surviving together. I know my experience is a privileged one. I'm thankful every day for the mental health care, time and resources referenced in this reflection that are not available to many. That's why, although it felt like the worst of times, it, it could have been a lot worse. And that's why we UUs fight for social justice. Mental health should not be a privilege. That's a rope we can all grab onto and pull as hard as we can together. Now, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone. It's gonna be a really nice day, I think. Go outside, live, but remember that it's a school night. I have high hopes that this year will be a great one for all of us. Third grade, here we come. We will now have hymn number 90 from, from all the fret and fever of the day. Number 90. Surrender to this life. Let go of your anxieties. Let go of the stories that do not serve you. 
Let them go and be here. In joy, in pain, it is enough. You are enough. How are you going to take care of yourself today? Go, do it with gusto. There's no better way to take care of this beautiful, this heartbreaking world.